please, to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. <clears throat> Starting in verse 27. Now there came to him some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, and they questioned him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a child, and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died childless. And the second and the third married her, and in the same way, all seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven married her. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot even die anymore, because they are like angels and the sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Being, pardon me, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this wonderful passage as we uh, this morning begin to consider when you die, what then? And thank you, Lord, that in a most impressive way and in, in a most helpful way, our Lord has answered all of the things that we need to know in the Word of God, and many of them we find just right in this very passage. So, Lord, I would pray you'd tune our hearts to give attention to it, help us to glean what is here, with benefit, help us to have our prejudices and even some of the, the curried notions that we might have. Help us, Lord, to abandon those at the favor of your word. And Lord, I would pray that your word and your Holy Spirit would have free course in each heart, including mine. Enable me, equip me, I would pray for the task at hand. And Lord, I would pray that your spirit would have free course in every heart here and that if there are some here who have walked in and they, they are not those who would attain to the resurrection from out the grave, that this day that would change for them. For your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, throughout the history of mankind, the biblically illiterate and the Bible rejection, rejecting portion of mankind has professed to hold some strange and even rather outlandish notions as to what happens when we die. Romans, for example, not the book, the people, Romans buried their dead with a coin, normally a gold coin, on their lips to give to the boatman who would ferry them across the river Styx. In their um, mythology, there was a line that separated the um, earthly conscious from death, and it was the river Styx. Those that did not have the requisite fare were forced to haunt along the banks of the earth side of the river and therefore haunt among the earth for hundreds of years. That was the belief. The Egyptians, 
they mummified, not everybody, but a few of the elite. And they would place the body in a sarcophagus that looked remarkably like a rather trim and small canoe. It's because they believed that the body needed to be intact and that the magical charm-covered boat that they were in, they needed to be in one of those in order to make it into the afterlife. They were often buried with grain and other food and even often slaves who either willingly or unwillingly joined them on that journey. Greek philosophers like Pythagoras and Plato believed, along with the Hindus, in something called reincarnation. And various polls have found that up to 40% of current Americans believe in it as well. The ancient tribes in Greenland buried a child with a dog that they thought would lead them to a warmer, safer place in the afterlife. And in case we are inclined to feel superior in our day, what about popular culture today? What is the most common, even among church people? Well, good old Billy. Billy died, and now he is, that's right, an angel because that's how that works. Or, Billy died. And a week later, Billy's sister was sitting in the garden and saw a dramatically blue butterfly, and somewhere a bell rang. Aha! It's Billy! There it is, it's Billy. All we can say is hopefully Billy doesn't cross paths with a hungry robin, given his lack of basic camouflage. Well, the Pharisees had their own ideas as well. Because of numerous places like the book of Daniel or the book of Job, they did believe in the resurrection to their credit. But they added details. And you've got to know something. Every time you add to the word of God, it is neck reductionist. Every time you add something to the word of God, you destroy. Don't do it. Anyway, they added details. Billy had a large black mole on his ear in life. Now, that is how God made him. That was one of his distinguishing features, they reasoned. Therefore... In the resurrection, Billy has a mole again and the same crooked finger, because that's how God wants Billy to be, evidently. And they reasoned Billy will be resurrected with the same clothes he died in. After all, he engineered their death. So how will we know Billy? Well, don't you know what robe he died in? That's him. How did they get there? Well, they were very comfortable with bad mathematics called addition. Any mathematics in the area of theology, particularly in the area of bibliology, any mathematics is bad mathematics, but they were bad at addition. Addition to the text through interpretive, inventive additions. But Billy will, they thought, just continue with the same body, fat, short, or crooked, and the same life circumstances, like the same wife. And so some of the Pharisees wrote, divorce her quick if you don't want to live in eternity with her. How about the Sadducees? Well, they mocked and ridiculed all of that, including the resurrection of the dead. Did they get there? Well, it'd be easy just to kind of read it over and and make some assumptions. Oh, they're just liberals and they don't take the word of God seriously. They did, actually. The Sadducees were a small group 
but they represented the lion's share of the elite of the priests. That was the main theology department of the nation of Israel. They were Sadducees. Well, how did they get there? Well, contrary to the Pharisees, they employed an interpretive method that amounted to subtraction. Subtraction. They pioneered an interpretive method that declared one part of Scripture to be the correcting lens of the other parts of Scripture. Rather than reading every part and taking every part at face value, they said, we need an interpretive lens. And so they would put in the way of Scripture an interpretive lens and read the rest of the Scripture through that. They pioneered that particular methodology. Their hero was Moses. <coughs> Pardon me. They believed that the 613 articles of the law of Moses was prime, the standard, the real, and really, they said, the only point of Scripture, the only point of Scripture. So any other part of Scripture was just there to cast light on the law's and the life of their hero, Moses. And in that, they were grandma, gra not grandma, grammar Nazis. Word tense Nazis. They were intense on word smithing. And that's not a bad thing in itself. I respect that. Unless, as in their case, as they're doing it, they looked at the rest of the Old Testament through the lens of the law of Moses which, of course, is an artificial construct. The lens they loved and embraced distorted the natural meaning of the other texts and authorial intent of a passage was ignored. The angel posted to keep men out of the Garden Eden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, take it non-literally as an, an elaboration of one of the laws easy. The frequent references to either good angels or wicked angels, well they would respond, there's nothing like that in the 613 commandments, so it's safe to take that as an allegorical or non-literal element. Satan who is disputing with God about Job, allegory. The wicked angels in contest with Michael in the book of Daniel, Nothing like that in the law of Moses, so Moses corrects and interprets the other parts for them. In fact, they believed an entirely different hermeneutic needed to be employed with all passages that were deemed as prophecy. For example, turn with me, if you would, to one that seems like it should be fairly straightforward. Daniel chapter 12. <coughs> Pardon me. Daniel chapter 12, now at that time Michael the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time and at that time your people and at that time your people everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. There's the idea. And, and the Greek carried that through into the, the term used for resurrection. The term used in, uh, for resurrection means awake, sit up, get up. And the dynamic equivalent to that is the Hebrew word that's found here. They will awake. By the way, that's why believers and those who've had some influence under the Bible began to talk about cemeteries rather than graveyards. They called them cemeteries because they were understood to be sleeping dormitories, not places of rotting people who will never be again. Sleeping, uh, uh, sleeping dormitories. 
the idea that all of them are going to arise again at some point. So many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Well, that seems fairly straightforward. But if you decide, yeah, I know, but prophecy, so you always interpret that and you always use a different hermeneutic. Did any of the law discuss the resurrection of the dead or any afterlife at all? And you would say very quickly, no, it didn't. Thank you, sweetheart. There's nothing in here, is there? I'm Baptist. Okay. Sorry. Did any of the law discuss the resurrection of the dead or any afterlife at all? Well, therefore, it didn't. Therefore, you just die and that's the end. That was their theology. They noted all punishments that are discussed in the law of Moses, uh, all punishments in the law were temporal punishments. They were punishments in this life, in the land, and so forth. There was no discussion of any afterlife punishment, and therefore they concluded there is no afterlife. That's how they got there. If you scoot ahead, for example, to... Acts chapter 23 for a moment. Acts chapter 23. Paul is in a tight spot, but Paul is uh, not short on cunning. He's a clever chap. Verse 6, perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. And he said this, and pardon me, and he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged all of them. Okay? And they got there through scripture. They would say they got there through diligent study. Just that they had a little twist to their study. Well, no afterlife, they said. So, the two groups. The Pharisees had added to scripture in a massive and fanciful imaginative way. And the Sadducees subtracted from scripture scripture with the imposition of their interpretive lens. And the Sadducees frequently and freely mocked and ridiculed the very otherworldly notions of the Pharisees and the otherworldly passages of Scripture. Well, let's go back to Luke chapter 20. They give this long account of a story. And some would say, well, this is just a made-up thing. I think there's, that's a good possibility. In the account that we have in the book of Acts, it says, and there was a certain woman with us here. And the idea was that they are actually referring to a case that they are aware of that had occurred somewhere close to them, but we're not sure possible. Anyway, if a man's brother dies having a wife and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up the children to his brother. That's very clear and straightforward. That is in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And so they construct the story. Now there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died childless. Why the emphasis on childless? Because the whole point of this marriage arrangement was to, it was understood, provide an heir for that line and that tribe. So she has done her work so that the first male heir that she produces goes back to the first man that she was married to. 
Well, the lady took, uh, uh, he, uh, now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died childless. Okay, so now this marriage arrangement should kick in. And the second and the third married her, and in the same way all children died, leaving no children. If you were to stop at this point and read about this in theology manuals, you would understand that this is referred to as the Leverite marriage. It's frequently referred to that, and, and that can be confusing because it sounds like it's something to do with the, the tribe of Levi, or it sounds like it could be something to do with the book of Leviticus, but that is a misunderstanding. It is called, in the Latin, uh, leveri, which means brother's wife. And so it is a confusion because there's uh, a recourse to a Latin phrase, which is why we have terms like rapture, again, another Latin phrase. Anyway, the word leveri meant brother's wife marriage. And that has not been always really straightforward with every culture. There's a few little twists along the road. For example, in the Swedish language, which I'm not going to try and duplicate for you, even in the least, there is uh, the leverite, the uh, brother-in-law or sister-in-law, more specifically, there is, it's the same word as half-sister. And so, in the nation of Sweden, they have said, based on this passage, you need to allow people to marry their half-sister. And again, it's just based on a bad understanding of what the word is. It happens also, that's part of the legislation of Brazil, strangely enough, all from this passage. Anyway, that isn't the word in the Hebrew, and it's not the word in the Greek. This is a yibum marriage. Yibum marriage. And the alternative of that was to have a kalitza. A kalitza. If you did not want to have a yibum marriage, where you married your sister-in-law, you would have a kalidza. And the kalidza was rather a strange public event. The fellow who was saying, I don't want to marry her, would be seated down in a public square. And the wife, the, the lady she should that he should be married to, in a ceremony, unlatches his sandal. And all the while they are unlatching the sandal, everybody around them dutifully spits. That's a nice little ceremony. And uh, then she takes away the sandal, and he becomes known as the man of one sandal. And you go, what in the world? The closest anyone has come that I think with satisfaction is the idea that here it is, both the man and the woman are being exposed to public humiliation and ridicule, and therefore in the Jewish mind, they're dead, and if they're dead, then they can remarry whatever they like. Anyway, bad, whatever. But anyway, it was either Yabim or Kalidza. Well, Verse 32, finally the woman died also. Finally the woman died also. Got to tell you, at the end of her life, this lady in the concocted story theoretically needed to produce a male heir for all seven. So all of their tribes went forward, but she failed. I got to tell you, if I was brother number seven in this imaginary scenario, I would be checking what kind of mushrooms she keeps on putting in the omelets and what kind of forage root she keeps on including to flavor that last bowl of soup. 
Anyway, this was meant as a mockery of the Pharisees. And it was attended as a mockery of Jesus and the resurrection he taught about. Turn with me ahead, if you would, in your text to John chapter 5. Famously, at this point in time, <coughs> Christ has gone on record teaching. John chapter 5. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. That's the awake part. And those who hear will live. And just as the Father has given has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Anyone know what that is called? Where God has life in himself? I hear somebody saying, Asiety, well done. And he gave authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of God. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all, 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 who are in the tombs, will hear his voice and will come forth. Oh, cool. Everybody gets resurrected. Hmm. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Maybe good news. Maybe incredibly bad news. More of that to come. Well, Jesus, though, had taken a very public stand on being in support of and interpreting the Old Testament properly and saying there is a resurrection. Job said that. He says, I know that in my body, my body, the worms are going to eat. I'm going to decompose. Yet in my flesh, I will see God. Not just in some sort of an ethereal spirit thing, I will sort of sense. Or, in my flesh, I will see God. Resurrection. So Jesus was very publicly in favor of resurrection, and he very publicly pronounced that he, in fact, was the resurrection and the life at the tomb of Lazarus a matter of days earlier. So... They're mocking all of it in Luke chapter 20. In the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Verse 34. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, literally, from out of the dead. Um, pardon me, where are we? Neither, uh, for, uh, uh, but uh, oh, I got to start over here, 35. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Okay, so here's a few things. First of all, he says marriage is for this ionos in the Greek, for this era. Marriage is for this era. And then he says, verse 35, the estate of marriage does not apply to the future era. This corrects the foolish speculation and the practice of adding to scripture of the Pharisees. That was good. That was a necessary correction. Verse 36, for they cannot die, they cannot even die anymore, because they are like angels and are sons of God, being the sons of the resurrection. Again, one of the reasons for marriage was the replacement or the succession of those that die, and therefore the preservation of a dying race. With a resurrection body, death is no longer a possibility. You cannot die. There's a difference between a immediate creation 
and an immediate creation. There are people, there are individuals who are called sons of God in the text. And that is because they are immediate creations. God did not create them through some other mediating force like parents. Uh, Adam, Eve, and angels are referred to as sons of God because they are immediate creations. Everything after that, they are creations of God, but they are immediate creations. He creates them through the agency of parents. Okay, so there's a difference between immediate and immediate creation. Immediate ones are referred to as sons of God. Well, a defining quality of being born from above, a new creation, is that there is de facto a body that cannot die, a re a resurrection body. God cannot die, and someone born from above, if he is born from above, will of necessity have a body that similarly cannot die. Because they are like the angels, for a moment people go, oh, okay, so maybe we do go around and... No, uh, Matthew corrects that and he says, they are like angels in this respect, they don't die. That's the only point of comparison. He's not saying that they look like angels, anything like that. In as much as angels don't die, they don't die. Okay? They're like angels and the sons of God being the sons of the resurrection. So, people who have a resurrection body of necessity have to be resurrected and a resurrected body does not die. We see that elaborated on in 1 Corinthians, for example, 15. Turn with me there if you would for a moment. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, scoot ahead to verse 53. For this perishable, talking about a body, must put on the imperishable of necessity without fail. This perishable must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We see the same uh, point alluded to in Romans chapter 6. Turn there for a moment, if you would, please. Romans chapter 6. He says in verse 4, Therefore you have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Here's the reasoning. <coughs> Pardon me. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. How did you say you got, became united with him? Because that's what the word baptismo means. You have been immersed into Christ, if that's the case. Um, you have been in, united with him in the likeness of his death. And if that's the case, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Scooting down to verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. It's, it, it, it is of necessity. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is mastery over him. So, if we've been united to that body, and the body is a resurrected body, we will live. We will be resurrected, and we will live forever. That's the point. Okay, so, let's go back to Luke chapter 20. So, he says, here's the thing that you have wrong. There, the, the life over there is not a continuation, like the Pharisee says, of the life here. It's a different, it, 
the resurrection body, we know what that looks like. You will not be going around looking like a Gila monster or an octopus. Christ had a resurrection body. It was bilaterally symmetrical. It looked humanoid. It was just, it had a few features like it could go through walls, for example. Anyway, he says, it is not a continuation of the old life. But now he goes, he's, he's not content with just um, challenging their bad theology here uh, about the resurrection. Now he's going to teach something, which is really good. Verse 37 is a great verse. I hope you, you appreciate the depth of this. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed, in the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Never turn down an opportunity to go back in Scripture. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am, present tense, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Scoot ahead to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel. I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's where we get our word Yahweh from. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh has sent me to you. Scoot ahead to Exodus chapter 4. He says again, <coughs> But the Lord, verse 4, said to Moses, Stretch out your hand, grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand, caught it, and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. We need to comprehend what kind of a blistering fastball rocketed right through the strike zone on this occasion. This is especially sweet. To the grammar Nazis, Jesus gives a grammar lesson and establishes the resurrection on the strength of a verb tense. He's not the God of people who were. Not the, he is the God of, not he was the God of. He is presently the God of. <clears throat> God is still in an active relationship with the patriarchs. Therefore, they did not pass into non-existence or into annihilation. They are still in an active relationship with God. You cannot have a real relationship, for example, with a pet rock. You should not try and substitute, while we're at it, a relationship with people with a pet. That's not appropriate. But you can't have a relationship with something that is dead. You can only have a relationship with 
something that has life, will, and personhood as well. For him, for God that is, all are alive. That's what he says here. Now, verse 38, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Look at that. For all live to him. What does he mean by that? For him, for God, all are alive. Man, once coming into existence, is eternal, either to his eternal joy or his eternal horror, shame, and contempt, one way or the other. Both in the Old Testament and this event, it is stressed that it is an individual relationship. They're not somehow merged into one big cosmic consciousness stream. He's not the God of the consciousness stream Abraham and company. He is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So um, they relate to God as they always did, as individuals. Mark adds at this point, he says, he records that Jesus said to the people, in this, in this particular thing that the Sadducees were holding to, you are greatly mistaken. This is a grave error. And Paul, when we go further into uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, you know something? It is one of those make or break tenets of the faith. If you're here today and you think, you know something, I'm a Christian. I loosely believe in the word of God. Maybe even I tenaciously believe in the word of God, but I have this lens, whatever. But the idea of the resurrection, that everybody, everybody comes alive again and gets a physical bot? No, I, I don't believe that. You know that when they did a poll, the majority, an overwhelming majority of church people in evangelical churches do not believe in the resurrection. They would ask, do you believe in the resurrection? Yeah, we do. And then they'd ask the follow-up question, do you believe that when people die, they will be eventually supplied a physical body to go through eternity with? They go, no, no, don't believe that. Don't believe that. Paul says, that's a basic tenet of belief. That's a basic tenet of orthodoxy. If you don't believe that, you're not saved. You're not saved. In this, he says to these people, you are greatly mistaken. This is a grave error. And then he says they did not understand the scriptures or the power of God. That was their problem. Well, at this point, Matthew records for us, the crowd is amazed. Matthew uses a rather neat word, which means to strike out of one's wits. He blew their minds, in other words. Back in our passage in Luke, the pro-resurrection scribes described in our passage, it says, they were in respectful awe. Verse 39, some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. Oh, that was pretty good. Uh, good answer. Hadn't thought of that one. For they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. So, what a great answer. God uses Moses, their hero, the law, their lens, and says, here's where you missed it, and it's right under your nose. What a great answer. I, I'm saying with the scribes, boy, um, you've spoken well. He did. He spoke well. They realized they could never beat him. And so they quit asking him questions. I hope if you're here today, you believe the same thing. You will not outfox our Lord. 
Well, let's do some takeaways from this. First of all, this is a wonderful lesson in inerrancy. The inerrancy of scripture. Jesus has such confidence in the down to the very word accuracy of scripture that he argues his case on the basis of a verb tense, which represents the smallest change in spelling. That's all. But it's down to the basis of a verb tense. Jesus is demonstrating his absolute confidence that the word of God is accurate and flawless down to that level of detail. Therefore, there is no adding and there is no subtracting. Discard the lens. Read the text. Next little takeaway I would suggest. When confronting error, do not respond with your own reasoning and even the finest of human logic. Don't we do that frequently? People can come to us with some sort of a theological question or some quandary they have about God and, and we respond with some sort of a philosophical thing. Don't do that. Jesus was extraordinarily capable of both reason and logic, more so than any man who walked the earth. But the Son of God, capable of brilliant discourse, used the Word of God, and in particular, a precise exposition of the text to answer problems. Now, our situation in Jesus is a little different. Jesus spoke the words of God be always because he was the son of God. But for us, why would you tell stories or either heartwarming or heart-wrenching illustrations when you can use the live seed of the word of God that does have the possibility of creating life? Why would you do anything else than use the word? Employ the word with a searching or even a mocking co-worker. A searching or a mocking family member. Parents, a searching or even a mocking child. What are you going to do? Use the word. Use the word. Next one. Got a big um, revelation for you. At some point in time, if you're here listening to me, you were born. You got born. In that, you were a immediate creation. We see that and we celebrate that when we See all these moms holding a little bambino, and we go, oh, I can, I can see mama, and I can see daddy in there. They're immediate creation. God mediated your creation through the agency of your parents. But those who will experience the resurrection of the just, the first resurrection, the resurrection to life from out the grave, do so because they are born from above, born again, John chapter 3. He says to Nicodemus, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born anothen, anew again from above. You have to, if you will have anything to do with seeing the kingdom of God. <coughs> In doing so, if you are born from above, you become one of the sons of God. You become, at that point, an immediate creation of God. And the spin-off of that is if you have in your spirit become an immediate creation of God, that will of necessity need to be joined at some point 
to a body that fits it. So the subjects, the products of that creation must of necessity must live again, this time in a body that cannot die for eternity. It is the necessary nature of the case that those who experience this creation of a new nature, by new he uses the term categorically different from the first, those who have a new nature must be resurrected to a body that cannot die. And that's Paul's point in Romans 6. Have you been baptized into the body of Christ? If you have, you can be absolutely certain you're, you're going to live again and not some cloud-like existence. You're going to have a body, hopefully without moles. I don't think with moles. You're going to have a body that has the durability greater than a John Deere. You'll have the, it'll have the durability that it will last forever for whatever wear and tear you're going to be involved in. You'll have a body that cannot die. Next one, in the age to come. It's a different age. And the institution of marriage at that point is past. Loving human relationships, however, are not over. But relating through that institution is over. People have speculated, and here's the problem, God takes revelation as far as what is helpful, and then he closes the curtain. And usually when we try and probe past that curtain, we end up trying to mess around with information that would not be helpful or would be actually harmful. So there's some deliberateness when God closes the curtain. He gives us some, some information. In the resurrection, will we have gender? Yes. How many genders? Same as always, two. Pourquoi? Why will we have genders in glory? There's an easy answer. I have no idea. Keep it there. However... We do know whatever is in the future is better than an improvement on the relationships that are possible here, not a loss and not a diminishment. Heaven, living in the immediate proximity with God, is never going to be less or a diminishment of what we have enjoyed here. Last one, verse 35. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age. <coughs> That's a, immediately introduces a kind of a first class condition. Those who are worthy have the resurrection of life. Daniel talked about that. Some people get resurrected to life. Some people get resurrected to everlasting shame and contempt. John, chapter 5, Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? Those who are considered worthy. By whom? God. Question. Will a holy God, who cannot look upon with acceptance any slightest degree or nuance of sin, look at what comes out of your mouth? Look what rolls around in your mind, which is easily seen to him. And what is the private, personal, secret life you live that you think nobody knows about, but God does? Well, the God that sees all of that in you Will he, without lowering his perfect standards of holiness, pure holiness, consider you worthy? How would you answer that? Well, what's the standard? Perfect. 
Holiness. Holiness in whose view? God, as God defines pure holiness, which is perfection. So really what I'm asking is, do you have the idea today that you're perfect? You go, well, well, I'm not perfect, but, you know, I think God will accept me. God accepts perfection. Do you think you're perfect? Will you be considered worthy? You have one shot of having a standing before God that's perfect. Turn, if you would, to Romans 3. He says very clearly, verse 20, because by the works of the law, by me keeping the law, by me keeping some standard of morality, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If you learn the law well enough, all you realize is you are done like dinner. You didn't make it. And even if you were able to achieve perfection from here on in, the ship has left and you can't go back. What do we do? Chapter 4, verse 1, what shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? Was Abraham perfect? Emphatically, no. For if Abraham was justified by works, if that was the case, he has something to boast about. I mean, that's a, that's a big thing he figured out there. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited. It was charged up to his account as righteousness. He goes on. Now to the one who works, in other words, if it was on the basis of somebody earning his way, his wage was not credited as a favor, but what is due? God would just be going, oh, I mean, I owe it to him. Question. Do you think, are you one of the ones who thinks, I get to go to heaven because God owes it to me? Huh? Do you, are, are you thinking in those terms? Abraham didn't. But to the one, verse 5, who does not work, I'm not talking about unemployment, but the one who does not work, in other words, I'm not somehow trying to earn my salvation before God, but believes in him who justifies, legally declares from this day forward somebody not just not guilty, but actively righteous. He who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as, that's what you need. Righteousness. That's the perfect righteousness you need. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Interesting word. It's the same idea as when they would confess the sins on laying their hands on the scapegoat. And send it off. Send it away. He said, blessed is the one who, that's what God's done with their sin. Just sent them away. Sent them away from. Goes further. And whose sins have been covered. Doesn't mean you found a way that you could get it done and, and, and somehow hide it. It's an aorist passive indicative meaning as a specific and at a very specific real point of time, something was done to that person. Something was done for that person that that person did not earn or even participate in. And it was 
Sins covered over, and they're covered over because they are legally paid for. The debt is paid. That's why Jesus on the cross said, Tetelestai, paid in full. Next, verse 8, blessed is the man who sinned, the Lord will not, and there's a, another great Greek word here, take into account. He will not permit that record to survive on the official ledger and be allowed into the calculation in the court of heaven. If you have a God who does something like that for you, those are the guys who make it. Those, and only those, will be the ones who will be considered worthy. Because they have the worthiness, they have the righteousness of Christ. All others, they live to God as well, don't they? They are eternal as well. And they will have a body specially formed and created for them to be eternally attached to. And that body will be cast into the lake of fire. So, in conclusion, listen with me, if you would, with fresh ears to John chapter 1. Verse 11, he came to his own, his own things, literally. And those who were his own, his own people, did not receive him. But as many as received him took to themselves the very person of Christ. To them he gave the right to become, there it is, children of God, an immediate creation of God, even to those who believe on his name. I'm putting everything and all of my eggs into one basket. And that is, I'm counting on the righteousness of Christ applied to me to make it nothing else. Who were born not of blood. Your heritage counts nothing. Your background who your parents were, who your uncle is, counts nothing. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. No efforts, no personal moral efforts will ever get you here. Nor of the will of man. The efforts of a parent, the efforts of a priest, or the sacramental, sacramental efforts of another will not value will not benefit you in any way. No one's going to pray you into heaven. No one's going to pay you into heaven or preach you into heaven at your funeral. You're not going to make it on the strength of some supposed saint interceding for you and getting you in. It will not be on the will of man, but of through the agency as the source of God. And so I'm going to ask you, are you one of the ones who's going to be counted worthy? What are you trusting in? You? Your religious program? Or saying, not the labor of my hands could fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no langer show? Could my, I forget what the next line is, something for, could my tears forever flow? No amount of, man, I'm really sorry for the sin is going to pay for it. None of that is going to show. It has to be Jesus paying my sin or nobody makes it. If you're here today and that has never happened, would you do that today to the glory of God and to the joy of his people? Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage, the reminder of the resurrection, the truth of the resurrection, and the encouragement and truth of your matchless wisdom in using Scripture and its dependability. We want to praise your name forever in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll call on our music team. <clears throat>